Um, what Carrie said was very important. In, in muscle testing, there are things called false negatives, as there are in lab tests and other things. So false negative is where you don't find something that's there. So if we're doing kinesiology in the office, we don't want to have a perfect office. If, if we have a perfect office, we have perfect personalities and other things, the people are going to be so happy to be in there <clears throat> that we're not going to find things. It's just going to override our findings. So that's why I have a nasty personality. But, but more important is some doctors, you know, if you go in and you're getting tested, they say, take off your glasses, and you know, they have some type of perfect lighting in the place. If we do that, or if we were to take a person and t have them step outside, we're not going to find anything on these people because the power of light is going to give us a lot of false negatives. It's just the person's going to be so happy in that environment. So, you know, for, for years we've been doing that just because, you know, light is so important. Um, in 1981, my wife and I moved to the Big Island, and we were living in a, <clears throat> above a pickup truck, on one of those campers that fit over a pickup truck. And we had a practice in Javi. I don't know if anyone has been to Javi. And so what happened was we had an opportunity to caretake. I'm going to sit, it's just easier. And so we, <clears throat> we were caretaking an 80-acre macadamia nut orchard. And it was on the mountain road between Javi and Waimea. And it was, they had like every kind of fruit tree growing there. Um, we had a vegetable garden. It was just an ideal place. It was like $200 a month. And we were the only people on the property. But we lived in this um, kind of bungalow, and all around it were trees. And so we'd notice certain things. Like if we had shoes in the closet that we hadn't worn in a while and we took them out, they were green. And you know, there was just all kinds of mold growth, but there wasn't a lot of awareness of, of mold back then other than like um, people like Dr. Trust talking about candida albicans. It, there just wasn't a, a lot of information on the effect of, of molds and health. But after being exposed to that, I started getting migraines. Um, I started becoming sensitive to foods. Uh, like I couldn't eat avocados anymore. They would just make things a lot worse. So eventually we moved, and um, we moved to New Hampshire. And in New Hampshire, the place we lived in was fine, but I w I've always been a collector in my life, and I decided I'm going to collect antiquarian books on either Bible prophecy or health. So I, I amassed this collection in, in health of people like Sylvester Graham, who invented the Graham Cracker, and Dr. Kellogg, who had these health sanitariums, and, and Bible prophecy books that went back as far as like Isaac Newton. So, so fairly old books. And um, we used to spend our time when we weren't working going to all these used book barns they had all over New England. And so we moved to West Virginia um, after a year, and we brought the collection there. And I had 1,000 old books in my treatment room. And it wasn't very long until I got a really bad case of chronic fatigue, where by like 11 AM, I couldn't practice every day. And headaches and brain fog. And it was all from inhaling the mold, basically. And, um, after seven years in that environment, and that's where Noah was born, um, <clears throat> we moved to Colorado. We left everything behind, all the furniture behind, all the books I got rid of. And um, it, it was then that we started learning more about the effects of mold. I, I was studying with a group of doctors who were, I don't know, even know if they're still around, but they're clinical ecologists. And they, and they measured the effect of different environmental variables on health. They would look at molds. They would look at chemicals. They would look at metals. They would look at foods. And um, you know, Candida was getting kind of big. I was actually teaching a little bit with another doctor, to two doctors about Candida infections and how to treat them. But then we realized you know, that Candida is one of you know, thousands of molds. And when you look at molds, what type of environment do molds tend to thrive in? They, they thrive in warm, wet, and dark. 
So what is a good, warm, wet, and dark environment? Your body. So it doesn't take much inhalation in certain people that are more prone to it for various either deficiency reasons or genetic reasons or emotional reasons or whatever, um, for them just to start having mold grow in their body. And depending on, it likes to grow in hollow places. You know, it might be in your lungs, it might be in your bladder, it might be you know, just about anywhere. And um, so you know, we started researching and we started doing testing and we found that there were scores of different molds that can live in people's bodies. And you know, we started looking at the effects and finding ways to treat it. Um, go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, so today, I mean, everything, there's a concept that we always follow called total load. There's many different things that can affect the body negatively. Also good. Um, there's many different negative things that can affect the body. And it's like almost you don't have any symptoms until you get to the top of that cup and the water starts to spill out. You can have emotions as part of your stressors. You can have environment as part of your stressors. You can have stress as part of your stressors. Infections, foods that you eat, um, bad lighting. All of those are things that contribute. And in some people, you know, you can make some very easy changes. Some people, you need to affect all of them to really get that load below the cup so they stop having the symptoms again. Um, there's Dr. Sherry Rogers that said, I believe, you know, how many if you have 100 nails in your foot, how many nails do you need to pull out until you start feeling better? And that really depends on the person. My mom, take out maybe five, and she could go for a 10-mile run. My dad, you're looking at like 99 to 100 till he feels better. So everyone's a little bit different. Some people you could do any type of treatment on. You could just work the motions. You could just work the infections. You could just fix their lighting. And everything's going to get amazing. And then other people, you have to do all of those different types of things on them. So infections is one thing that we're, I mean, we don't ever like to take anything out of context. You need to treat the person as a whole. If you just do one thing, you're the results are going to be subpart in a lot of people. So we like to um, basically deal with as many different things as we can at once. So one of the key things that we like to deal with are infections. Infections can be parasitic, they can be viral, they can be bacterial, they can be biofilm, they can be Lyme, it can be fungus. So today we are talking about fungus because I would say this is one of the more important things that we deal with. But obviously, you don't ever want to take it out of context. Um, and I know my dad and I had a debate a while ago. He was correct. It is pronounced candida, not candida. Won't judge you either way, but he was correct, candida. Um, you know, this is just a fun little thing. You know, one thing a lot of people say is, oh, I took antibiotics and it gave me a fungal infection. Kind of true, kind of not. More not, actually. Um, you actually, antibiotics don't give you a fungal infection. If you have mold, different types of mold inside you, but your body's keeping it at bay. The good bacteria are keeping it at bay. Then you take an antibiotic, it kills off the bad bacteria, hopefully, it kills off the good bacteria, then there's open real estate. Open real estate, the molds look inside, ooh, I can grow and take that over, and then you start to get mold or fungal type symptoms. So it's not that the antibiotic gives it to you, but it creates an open terrain for the fungus to grow if you already have it inside you or if you are already exposed to it. Um, just a fun little joke, but um, is anyone ever here, or was I the only one that grew up watching Home Improvement with Tim Allen? Okay, cool. We got a few of you guys, then hopefully you will find this funny. We like to have a little comedy in here. Blindfold in place, Al? Yes, it is, Tim. Okay, step in position there. Ready? Yes. Aim, fire! <laughs> <laughs> Just check in if you're breathing, Al. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> As you can see, I've got our three samples of wood laid out on the workbench. I will hand them to Al one at a time, and he claims he can tell us what type of wood it is just by smelling it. We shall see. Al Borland, name that wood. Tim, that's hickory. Can you believe it, ladies? This man's single. 
Second sample, Al Borla, name that wood. Cedar. Ha, wait. <laughs> Western red cedar. You almost messed that one up, Al. Well, I'm fighting off a cold, Tim. <laughs> Well, this next sample <laughs> should be a little bit more difficult to discern, Al. Might have to take a big old whiff of this thing to figure out what it is. Well, I'm up to the challenge, Tim. I certainly hope so, Al. <laughs> Al Borland, name that wood. <laughs> oh! Well, it's, it's, it's a hardwood from the Pacific Northwest. And, oh. Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, this particular piece seems to have some, some type of a fungus. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, oof. Let me, let me try this again. <laughs> All right, thanks for bearing with us on that. Um, one of our favorite shows and episodes. But, you know, people can really sniff out mold growing in houses. Houses is probably the most common place that you get it. I either say spouse or house in the most common ways to get a fungus. Either your spouse has it. I mean, they've done a study, I know it was, um, they talked about it in Time Magazine, in a 10 second French kiss, you pass back and forth 80 million bacteria. Um, you're also passing back fungi and other things. So you can pass them back very fast in spouses. Um, also, houses, very big thing with um, how mold grows. And it could be your house, it could be your place of work, your place of worship, all of those different types of things. Like I might have mentioned, going and use bookstores, things like that. You can definitely, I mean, I know after COVID going in a lot of the businesses on Maui, after they've been locked up for so long, they all smelled really musty and moldy. Some still do, unfortunately. Some aren't too bad just because they were closed up. They didn't have that airflow and things really started to. I mean, for me, living here, when, when we would start house hunting, the main thing was, is there mold in the house or not? You know, and usually I'm really good at sniffing that, but um, you know, if you live in a house that's moldy, there's no 100% guarantee that you could remediate it. You know, because it, it can penetrate the, especially if you have like open beams, it can penetrate the wood. You know, it can penetrate the drywall and get behind it. And, and um, a lot of houses are just really challenged here. And, and you know, when patients come in, you know, a lot of times we, we try to pinpoint when symptoms start. And it's fairly frequent that symptoms started after they moved into a particular house or after they started a particular relationship, which could be microbial, could be emotional, but you know, we, we try to always take those things into account. Actually, house sniffed, uh, one of my patients is looking at a new rental, so Tuesday I stopped by for 10 minutes. I had him keep everything closed up for a day and sniffed it out for it. Actually got a clean bill of health. I was quite surprised since it was an older place in Makawao. But, but I, I teach a class on the Torah on Saturday mornings on Zoom. And when you get to Leviticus, what's really interesting is there are two chapters that just deal with fungus, which is more than what deals with a whole lot of other things in the Bible. And they, you know, they talk about it infecting people in terms of dermatological things. They talk about it infecting clothes and infecting houses. And you know, the job of the priest was to basically be a diagnostician in these things. And once they found it, they did a few things. I mean, they, they knew a whole lot more than we've known until recently. One thing they would do is they would remove the person from the environment. So they would take them out, they'd put them somewhere separate. And um, there were a couple of reasons for that. So basically, they were considered unclean, and for a certain length of time, they were by themselves. So you had them away from the mold, but at the same time, they had time for introspection. You know, if they're all by themselves, they have a lot of time to do some emotional healing if they take advantage of it. So they're by themselves, they do that, and then there's treatment that involved essential oils. And they would use cedar oil, they would use a couple of other oils. 
And um, you know, then they would come back and see how they're doing. Um, in terms of the home, you know, they would do certain things to the house too. And if the house wasn't better after a certain number of days, they tore it apart. And they took all the pieces of the house and they took it outside the camp because it was just basically a lost cause. I don't think that would go real well today, but it would be really a good thing for a lot of people to do. My dad actually wrote a book, um, I think it's on Amazon, God's Preventative Medicine, and it talks about a lot of things mentioned in the Bible that just seem really random and out of place. And just what God said to do it. And nowadays, there's actually a lot of science, and it explains why they would have said that, and it kind of actually has a scientific rationale behind it. I mean, one example is actually not in his book, but um, in Judaism, boys are circumcised on the eighth day. On the eighth day, they actually naturally have their highest levels of vitamin, key, um, vitamin K. It increases and then decreases. So for, if they're circumcised, then it's actually the safest day because they're least likely to have any bleeding issues because of the high vitamin K levels. And there's so many other things in there that just seem kind of random. Well, there's a time where like, if you have a, a female child, you have to stay away from the temple for twice as long as if you have a male child. And people might look at that and say, oh, it must be sexist, or it's this, or it's that. But not, I don't want to get into the genetics of it, but basically, if a woman has had a male child, their immune system comes back online like twice as fast, just because of how the X and Y chromosomes work and how some of the extra Y chromosomes are left in the blood supply of the woman, which they, it treats as a foreign invader after the birth, so the immune system ramps up a lot quicker. So like my dad mentioned, candida is a type of fungus. That's all it is. It's one of many candida albicans, has the best press. It's what everyone knows about. But there's so many different fungi. We treat them all indifferently. If it's candida, if it's a different type of fungus, it is what it is. They all get thrown in the same category for us. Um, dark, warm, moist environments, and like you said, the human body. Maui's also fits that pretty well, especially like Haiku where I live, or Fialtawelo, or some of those places. Symptoms can basically be anything. Um, fatigue, weight gain, brain fog, GI issues. I mean, hormonal imbalances, thrush, um, ringworm. I mean, pretty much anything can be linked back to a fungus. It's kind of scary if you look at all of it. But it's kind of cool how by treating one thing, again, not taken out of context, you can get rid of so many different symptoms in a very fast, short amount of time. It's pretty amazing if you look at it. I mean, the things that are probably the most common, though not everyone suffers from them, are fatigue, brain fog, and inability to lose weight. Definitely. I mean, you have your patients come in. We, you know, we don't encourage, but people come in just because they want to lose weight, and that's fine. And you have some people, and you talk to them, yeah, I never exercise. I eat McDonald's two times a day. I do this. I'm like, why are you here? Just stop doing that. <laughs> but then you have your other people. Like I've had lots of patients that like eat strict paleo. They exercise once a day, six days a week. They do really well, and they can't. And then it's pretty amazing. You almost don't even change their diet or change their lifestyle. You treat them for fungal issue, and they drop 10 pounds in two to three weeks. That's not uncommon at all. So it's for those people that are stuck. It can make huge differences in a fast amount of time. Um, again, so how do you get it? Again, antibiotics don't give it to you. They can deplete your good bacteria, so then it can kind of take over. Um, steroid use, again, it doesn't give it to you, but it weakens your immune system, so your body can't fight off mold exposure, either by breathing it in or if you already have some inside. Um, birth control and hormone replacement therapy. Estrone can actually increase um, candida growth inside the body, so that can be a big thing. That's also why women will have a certain spike in symptoms during a certain time of their cycle, or one of the reasons be because it can increase fungal growth in that time and then cause symptoms. One story which Carrie will appreciate is I had a patient who was a physician in Asheville, North Carolina, and we couldn't get him over his fungus. We were treating it and treating it, couldn't get over it, and he practiced on the second floor. And we were thinking about it, and we got some Petri dishes, and we inoculated them with a little bit of fungus. And we put one kind of in a random spot in his office. But where he stood, he was standing right above a bank of fluorescence. And when we put the Petri dish, well, the other Petri dish, right where he stood all day, the mold proliferated, pro proliferated way more than when it was just in the spot that wasn't over that. And once he moved his table, then it was no problem getting over it. You didn't say the why. What was there? The bank of fluorescent lights. Yeah. 
Um, again, mold exposure, depending on the vitality, the vigor of your nervous system, some people can go into moldy building all day long and be totally fine. Other people in there for less than five minutes and they're gonna go haywire and pick up a new infection. Definitely the healthier you are, the more you can fight it off. Also, the longer that you've been to get rid of a fungus inside you and keep it off. So if you just got rid of a fungus a week ago, you're more likely to pick up a new one. If you got rid of a fungus and been able to keep it out of your body for months and months and years, then you have a much bigger defense system in your body against it, which can make a big thing. Also, diet and different things along those lines. Um, you know, keeping your house clean. I live in Haiku. I have dehumidifiers running in my house to try to keep the humidity down at a low level. Um, different things like that can be really good. Again, sexual partners, if um, that's an easy way that you can get it. Um, pets, also. My dad had a patient with skin issues that he couldn't, he was having trouble getting rid of, which was rare at the time, in her, and he was talking to her, and she said, oh, my dog sleeps in my bed with me every night, and, but don't worry about the dog. The dog has rheumatoid arthritis. The vet's going to put the dog under next week. So my dad's like, huh, let's treat the dog. Treated the dog. The dog's RA went away, and then all of her skin conditions went away. The, it was a fungal issue that showed up there. So in again, the dog, in both of them. In both of them, yes. So she couldn't clear a fungal issue. Again, looking for the source. And that's a big thing of looking for, you know, you have to play detective work sometimes. We have people bring in, we test air samples from their house. Sometimes you check their animals. Sometimes you check their pillows or their mattresses. Sometimes it can be their air conditioning. There can be a lot of different places the mold can kind of hide. And if we're able to identify it, ideally deal with it, then they're not being re-exposed. And you're really not gonna get rid of a fungal issue if you're keeping re-exposed to it. So you wanna identify it, get rid of that, and then get rid of it in the person. And I mean, some people, if they're living in a moldy environment and they move to a different house, depending on the vitality of the person, some people feel a lot better when they move out of the house. Other people don't, and that's because it's still growing inside them. They're in a clean environment, but they need to treat the mold inside them. And then, now that they're living in a new place, they're not being re-exposed, and they start to feel great. So again, playing detective work and figuring things out. Um, you know, a lot of people, like Chris was talking about liver and things like that, you know, my dad and I do some things to support the liver, but we want to know why is the liver dysfunctional in the first place? You know, why isn't your liver functioning? God made awesome bodies with great organs. Why aren't they? If you have a fungus inside your body, it produces nasty chemicals, benzene, acetaldehyde. Basically, those are skull and crossbones you need a permit to buy. Not healthy stuff. Fungus is going to produce those. Then your liver has to break them down, so your liver is going to be overloaded. So your liver also breaks down hormones. I see a lot of hormonal issues in women, and by treating a fungus, the hormonal issues will normalize because then the f liver can break down estrogen normally so you don't become over-estrogenated, which is huge in our society from so many different aspects. So again, sometimes we'll give things specific for the liver, but we like to take a step back and look at root cause, what's going on, treat the root cause, and then the liver will normalize. And if I talk too fast or you guys have questions, please just let me know. Sometimes I get in a roll. Um, so again, acetaldehyde, it's, done, it's broken down. Um, that's going to use up all of your molybdenum. If you become low in molybdenum, it can lead to anxiety, insomnia, chemical sensitivities, muscle spasms, a lot of nasty stuff. And you, know, you can check to see, oh, you're low in molybdenum. Let's give you some. And, I actually just used a bottle of molybdenum with someone this week. But usually you want to know why are they deficient in it. And again, if we can treat the fungus, the liver isn't burning through all the molybdenum, then they don't need it. Same type of thing with selenium. Selenium is also important for chemical sensitivities, preventing cancer, immune boosting, a lot of different types of things. I mean, eating, eat some mushrooms, get some selenium in, it's good for you. But again, you need to, if someone's deficient in these things, you need to figure out why are they deficient treat the root cause so they're not just in that cycle and you're not just putting a Band-Aid on the issue. And you know, beside fungus, there's a lot of other things that can overload the liver. I mean, it could be internalized anger. That's gonna overload the liver. You know, it could be lots of toxic metals, toxic chemicals. You know, when babies are born and they might, you know, um, what's it called with the, where they need to get out in the sun? Oh, um, jaundice. Yeah, I mean, you take them out in the sun, you know, the light, helps basically, you know, complements the job of the liver. You know, the more you're out in the sun and you're sweating and everything else, the less work the liver has to do. 
And if you're out in the sun, make sure you're not eat, um, eating hydrogenated oils. Otherwise, that's going to increase your skin cancer risk a lot. So. Or wearing sunscreen. That too. <laughs> um, so again, nutrient deficiencies. Just like I said, you, know, you can keep cutting the weed down if you want to. But if you're not actually getting rid of the roots, it's just going to keep coming back. Again, my dad and I always, like, my dad wrote a book in 1985 about, oh, organ dysfunction, do this to help support the organ. And it can be really good, and it can help people. But then he's like, wait, why is the liver dysfunction in the first place? Let's try to get to that root cause so it, you don't have to keep supporting it. And that's the big thing of what we're trying to do is finding the root cause in a lot of people. And again, we're trying to find as many different root stressors on the person as possible and deal with as many of those as possible. Otherwise, you get rid of one weed, and another weed takes over. Um, so fungus prevention you know, big things. One is, you know, avoiding antibiotics unless you absolutely have to. Avoiding prednisone. Um, those are immune suppressants. Hormones, unless you absolutely have to. Um, avoiding it, you know, in your home and work environment. Those are big things. Ideally keeping your humidity below 60%, if not lower. That can be a really important thing. Um, borax can be a really good, if you have any mold that you see, cleaning it with borax and water can be a real big thing. Also, if you have any mold on your clothes, borax and water can help um, kill the mold on the clothes. Again, you got to figure out why you're getting it in the first place, but again, killing it can be beneficial. Um, making sure you don't have any water leaks, water damage, that type of thing can be very good. Um, some people at home, I'll have them put essential oils, cedarwood, tea tree in a diffuser. That's not going to kill mold in a wall or things like that, but it can help kill some of the spores in the air. And it can also, as you breathe it in, it can be therapeutic in some ways. Um, one of the biggest things that we'll have people do, you know, in Hawaii, you can still have water leaks and mold caused by water leaks, but with the humidity content, it's so easy to get mold just based off of natural humidity. So you can do different things if that's opening the windows more or less, if that's dehumidifiers, if that's fans, you can do different things like that. Ozonators are one of our favorite things that can kill mold in a place. You can get them for like 65 bucks on Amazon right now. Um, and you don't want to breathe in ozone. It's really toxic for you, um, pretty indiscriminate. It can make you really sick, just don't do it. Um, but if someone has like a moldy room in their house or something like that, I will have them basically nuke it with an ozon ozonator, move out of the, you know, turn it on, leave the house, leave it on for a few hours, come back in, turn it off, open the windows, then get out again, let it air out. And that can kill mold a lot of the time. Not all, but a lot of the time. And, and then we kill, like to recheck. It'll kill what it'll reach. So if you do something like that, open up all the drawers. You know, if you have books, fan out the books. Just have you know, all surfaces exposed. And you know, sometimes you either have seen visible mold in the bathroom or different things like that. Sometimes you just have that musty smell. That's another thing. A lot of the times in people with mold in their houses, you don't see visible mold. You definitely can in cases. But a lot of the times, it has that smell, but you don't visibly see it a lot of the time. But there still is mold growing there, and it needs to be treated. Otherwise, again, you're going to keep breathing it in, and that's going to cause a lot of symptoms. Chris, do you ever have those patients that come in and they just smell like mold? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that happens more and more, and people just start telling your symptoms like, yeah, that's what's causing it. Um, you know, testing. So in your houses, you know, there are different types of labs that you can run. No lab is perfect. Um, Immunolytics and Ermi, those are two you can get. They're not a bad price. Um, you know, if someone's looking at a new house and a little unsure, it can be worthwhile to run those. Um, we do muscle testing on air samples. We have people leave jars in different rooms overnight, put a tight lid in, bring it in, and we'll actually test to see how their body responds. You know, because everyone is so unique. We're all in unique individuals. And if you do a lab test on a house, it might have elevated of a certain mold, but for whatever reason, your body might do great with it and not have an issue with it. You could have another mold that's a fairly low level, but your body already has that in and is toxic from it, and that's causing a lot of issues. So the, mold, the tests tell presence, but don't say if you're sensitive to it. So how many people go to a functional medicine doc? Okay, let me tell you what I don't like about it. Um, lab tests are fine, 
but you can't treat based on a lab test. I mean, there are, if, like what Noah was talking about with nails in the foot, um, if you were to look at labs for, say, my wife and myself, my mercury levels might be 50 times lower than hers, and I'll be symptomatic for mercury and she won't. So, you know, lab tests don't tell you individual sensitivity. So you'll be treating something that you don't know if it's relevant or not. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of the time they'll be treating, and you might say, oh, I feel so much worse, and they'll go, great. You know, you must be detoxing. You know, we don't, we don't find that so much. I mean, we find if we've done everything right, you know, that people can handle things, and if they're feeling poorly, we've typically, either they've been cheating on us or we've made mistakes in our supplementation. Because um, a lot of supplements might be good in the sense that they can kill something, but again, a supplement that's strong enough to kill something can also be toxic under certain circumstances. So it might be the toxicness of the herb that's making them feel bad, not that it's doing a great job. So you know, functional medicine, we, we like to look at the lab sometimes to see if we're making progress, but we never treat from them because again, it, it's not dealing with, you know, like you could do stool samples. And on one, you know, everybody might have this parasite blastocystis hominis. But in five of the people, their body might be fine with it. Five of the people, it might be you know, driving them crazy. So again, sensitivity to me is more important than presence. And the second reason I'm not a big fan of functional medicine, I was having some health issues and we decided, okay, nothing's working, let's do all these functional medicine tests. This was about two years ago. And we just ordered some and we didn't realize that some of the tests overlapped. They were checking the same thing. So, you know, I, I needed to put, for instance, two different stool samples in um, for two different tests, but some of the things they were measuring were the exact same thing. And then when we got them back, you know, one of the labs would say, okay, I have plus four of this microbe. The other test would say, I got zero of that microbe. Same stool sample sent to same lab, same time. And when we, um, when we were teaching at a conference in Washington, kind of like the, the national SIBO expert came. And he was talking about doing stool samples. And he was saying, well, you know, we send in a stool sample to two different labs all the time, and there's only an 11% overlap in their findings. So, you know, when you look at that stuff, you have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. You know, one thing that my dad mentioned, which is something I think is one of the most important things I tell a lot of my patients is anything that's strong enough to help you can also be strong enough to hurt you. You know, you shouldn't just be taking things for the heck of it. If it's actually strong enough to be beneficial, it can screw you up. I mean, that can be, I've had patients who are literally just taking them off their B vitamin and all their diarrhea went away. Or a lot of people with herbs, you know, anything that is strong enough can hurt you. If you look in nature, animals have some type of innate intelligence and they go and eat certain plants when they're ill and they don't eat them when they're not ill. You know, it's like they know that's strong, I need that right now, and other times I don't because that can actually screw things up. So just taking things willy-nilly when you don't need them can really be bad. It's, you know, letting food be your medicine, and then when things go off, because we're not in a perfect environment anymore, then going to those different medicinals, and they can be really so beneficial. Who knows what one of the best antibiotics was in the 19th century? Mercury. It did a great job. But again, it has negatives. It's the same with colloidal silver. It does a good job, but it has a lot of negatives. It builds up in the body, it can cause neurologic issues. So again, just because something works doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, especially with things that are, um, that kind of squeak through so they're not prescription items. We tend to gravitate toward those. You know, we might take, um, you know, there, we have patients coming in that are taking, you know, large do dosages of melatonin. So what would be the downside of doing that? Yeah, their pineal is going to shut down. It's, it's going to say, hey, I don't need to you know, make any. I'm just relying on this stuff. So again, you know, a lot of things, just because they're non-prescription, be it DHEA or pregnenolone or melatonin, and they might actually make you feel good because they are correcting in a certain way, but in, a, in another way, um, you know, those abilities of yours are going to atrophy and you're going to create a much longer term problem. Um, 
a couple of cases I'm just going to kind of breeze through. I mean, you know, again, this is kind of like I mentioned, people that are doing everything right and not losing weight. So here is one person got up to 180 pounds, heaviest of their life, decided to start eating right, exercising, all that good stuff. And they dropped like two pounds and I think it was like six weeks, something like that. And that's frustrating if you're trying to. So got a good check, figured out, oh, this person has a fungal issue. They were already honestly on a perfect diet. They switched one after being on a bad diet. Treated the fungal issue with, I think it was noni, and then um, dropped 10 pounds in the next two weeks. So again, you know, if something isn't working right, you want to figure out why, what is screwing it up, and in this person, fungal issue, correcting that, and everything basically fixed. Um, another person came in with fatigue and depression. Those are kind of the two main things. And we gave them a couple things for that. They came back, they were sleeping better, decreased depression, lost eight pounds. They didn't even mention losing weight, but they actually did. It was more getting their body back to their, what they should be. Um, lost another five pounds, depression was all gone, felt all better than that in 10 years. I believe that was in four weeks. So not very long. It also taken off a few different foods, egg and corn. Those two specific, a lot of people eat eggs all the time. Eggs can be great. We got chickens, we got fresh eggs at our, at our place. But they definitely can be um, allergenic in certain people. So again, you know, trying to figure out what is going on in the person and correcting it and then allowing the body to restore and work as it normally should. What, um, what talk about fungal diet. I have it on later. Oh, okay. Um, I'll talk about, my dad mentioned fungal diet, I'll t get to that in a minute. Um, people always ask about probiotics. Um, I would say my dad and I recommend a probiotic every other year? I mean, never? I don't know. I don't carry them. I don't use them. 95% of the time, if someone brings in a probiotic, I tell them to stop it. Multiple reasons. Um, a lot of the probiotic strains out there, like Lactobacillus casei, among others, are histamine producing. That's going to make you more sensitive, more allergic, more inflamed. Um, not a good thing. If you read the label, that's a lot. Not all lactobacillus casei. A lot of probiotics contain Saccharomyces boulardii. That is a fungal that you're ingesting. So you're putting in fungus to help push out other bacteria, other, and, fungus. Um, other fungus. So it may help because you're getting rid of one fungus, but then you're replacing it with a different fungus that can cause issues. So that's another reason. Um, also, a lot of, we've talked to different medical doctors that we know, and they think the increase in prevalence of SIBO lately is because of overuse of probiotics. Um, it can, you know, more people do better without them. Um, there's a study that my dad always quotes from a while back, and they changed people's diet from basically normal diet to a whole food, fresh diet. And within three days, the bacteria in their gut naturally changed. So, you know, you can change your gut microbiome very quick just by changing your diet to more whole food, natural based. It's pretty amazing. You don't have to keep putting things in. And that's, again, I mean, most probiotics that you take aren't going to make it through the stomach acid also. You have to realize that. But even if they do, I mean, it's rare that I actually see them help anyone. Um, if someone is going on antibiotics, they always ask, should I take a probiotic? My answer is no. My answer is take an antifungal at the same time. So like one that I use a lot is Mirinda, which is noni. Not the fermented juice, don't like that at all. Not the stuff grown on Big Island. It all has heavy metals from the Vogue. But noni, you can get it from Kauai or other places. It can be a really good antifungal to take while people are taking a, um, anti uh, antibiotic. Again, if they have to. I don't recommend antibiotics, but they do have their time and place, blah, blah, blah. Um, or certain or, herbs like noni or, um, can be useful if you're traveling somewhere where you know there are going to be mold issues. Yep. So again, as a preventative and sometimes, not just taking it every day the rest of your life, don't recommend that, but sometimes preventative. If I go see my in-laws, their house is a little musty back in England, I take something then because I'm trying to kill off what I'm breathing in. Um, or again, if you're taking an antibiotic or something like that. I mean, you can do, and again, natural probiotics in terms of, you know, some good kefir, different things like that. If made properly, that's a different story. But I'm talking probiotics in a pill. Um, shotgun approach. You know, my dad and I, we pretty much never recommend uh, in supplements with a ton of different things in them. Because I guarantee you don't need everything in them. You know, if you go to Whole Foods and you get an antiparasitic, there's probably going to be 10 different things in that antiparasitic. 
And again, anything that's strong enough to help you is also strong enough to hurt you. So if in that 10 ingredient antiparasitic, maybe two are probably really good for you and are going to deal with your parasites. Probably two or three of them are going to actually have toxic things that your body doesn't run right out and they're going to hurt you. And then the other five or six things, I call it iceberg lettuce. They're irrelevant. They're not doing any good. They're not doing any bad. Um, you know, so again, we like to figure out exactly what you need for multiple reasons because in the shotgun approach, the two that are good are in such low quantities, it's hard to get up to a therapeutic level. Also, in your sensitive people especially, the bad things are going to be causing um, inflamed gut, they're going to be causing intestinal permeability, they're going to cause inflammation, and in a lot of people, that could outweigh the good from the good things. So that's why we like to, in a sense, make people, I mean, it's generally, you know, give them one, two, or possibly three different herbs that are the specific ones that they need, and then you can not give them the bad stuff, and you can give them a high enough dose so they're getting therapeutic levels and not have to take the others. If you have candida or, say, a fungal issue, and you're self-treating or you're going to a physician or whatever, if everything is done correctly, it should be gone in anywhere between two weeks most of the time, six weeks um, in severe cases. And if it's not better, you know, it could be wrong supplementation. It could be that um, there are some foods you're sensitive to. Because let's say you're sensitive to corn and you don't know it. Every time you eat that, your body's going to have an inflammatory reaction and it's not going to be able to focus on getting rid of the infection. Because it's not just the pills. Your body has to help. You know, or it could be you know, there's mold in your house or there's mold in your spouse or, or something like that. So you, you need to kind of be a detective and see, you know, why isn't it going away? Because, you know, it, it should go away very easily when most of those people, you know, a lot of the doctors are online, they say, oh, it's an 18-month program. You know, they're not checking all the different things and they're putting you on these things um, that are narrow spectrum, like maybe caprylic acid or undiselenic acid and they will help you decrease the population, but you're never going to get over it because you're going to keep on receding. And you know, taking those things over a long period of time might have negative consequences. I mean, and those are a couple, like I mentioned, with noni, with morinda, malia, which is neem leaf, scutellaria, which is bicolensis, golden thread, which is Chinese coptis, vidanga. You know, those are all great antifungals, and we use a mix of those, but we use a lot of other things also, depending on the person and what's going on. And again, it's finding the right thing for you at that time, because depending, you know, you might have had a fungal issue, you took something and it worked, but then a year later, you get a different fungal issue, the same thing may or may not work because it could be a different infection, but also your body's changed. You're not the same person that you are now as you were a year ago. Um, so again, you know, finding the individual what you need can be very important. So again, whenever someone has any type of mold, fungal overgrowth, I would say the three things you need to do, you need to starve it, you need to attack it, and you need to make sure that you're not being continually re-exposed. Those are the three things to do, and if you do all of those correctly, Two to six weeks, like my dad mentioned, and generally you will be feeling great and at least as far as we can tell, testing great. Um, fungal diet. So, you know, if someone shows up on egg or corn or gluten or different things like that, we take them off those foods. But for anyone that has some type of fungal issue, we put them on our fungal diet, which some things are stricter than typical candida diets that you see online, other parts are looser. Um, we have people take, go off sweetener. I call the bad sweeteners. No sugar, no corn syrup, no agave. Going off the good sweeteners also. No honey, no maple syrup, things like that. Um, also no fruit juice or dried fruit. But one thing that we do allow is fresh fruit. Um, some people don't feel well on fresh fruit, and that's fine. But we've never had to take anyone off fresh fruit in my dad's 40 years of experience to get them over a fungal issue. Um, that does include frozen fruits. Smoothies are OK also. And then one kind of other difference is we take people off mold-fermented foods. These aren't necessarily unhealthy, but they're not healthy when trying to deal with a mold or fungal issue. So I like people take off vinegar, all different types of vinegar, avoid those. Vinegar is a mycotoxin. It's produced, it's a fermented um, with a mold. Alcohol, soy sauce, miso, cheese if it is mold inoculated, your blue cheese, those types of um, yeast, tempeh, kombucha. Um, you know, kombucha, again, saccharomyces. 
um, can be good, again, with all of these, like miso, really healthy for you, but not when you're dealing with a fungus. Those are the key things of avoiding temporarily. Um, and then also, you know, we generally find stevia is okay, lemon juice, like a salad dressing, but like a lemon juice and olive oil, something like that, veggie juice, as long as it's not overly sweet with carrot. Um, and that's basically the fungal diet that we put people on. And by avoiding those while treating the fungal issue, we're able to get the person over the fungal issue, and then we can start reintroducing these foods. Obviously, you don't want to necessarily reintroduce sugar and corn syrup, but you know some of the healthier sugars, some of um, in moderation, you know, like honey, um, miso, different things along those lines. Um, Treatment. So again, you know, don't take anything out of context. If you just treat a fungal issue and a person has a parasite at the same time, you're going to kill off the fungal issue, hopefully, and then the parasite's going to grow and take over a new space. So you want to do things a lot at the same time. One cool thing about herbs, full spectrum as God made them, is the very broad spectrum. It's like if you ask my dad his favorite antifungal herb, it would be malia, which is neem leaf. If you ask him his favorite antiparasitic herb, it's malia, which is neem leaf. If you ask him his favorite antiviral, he might, depending on the day, he might say Malia, neem leaf. It's very broad spectrum and works for a lot of different things. He actually has an awesome tree growing out their property. The thing's grown like three feet in the past year. A lot of herbs grow amazing here. It's pretty awesome. Um, and so again, you know, t taking the right thing and not taking things out of context, checking sexual partners and pets. A lot of times we'll have people bring in a saliva sample from their spouse so we can see if they're reacting to their partner's saliva. And if so, then we need to treat them also Otherwise, you're probably not going to get over your issues. Um, again, pets, air samples, all of those types of things. Um, and another cool thing, you know, if you look at a lot of foods in native cultures, people innately knew to eat certain foods in it to help prevent infection. Um, what comes with sushi on every plate? Wasabi and ginger. And I'm not talking horseradish with green food dye. I'm talking real wasabi. It's a great anti-parasitic. You pick up parasites in fish, wasabi can help kill it. Real ginger, not dyed with red food dye and all the junk that they add into it. Real foods can be beneficial. In Thailand, you put lemongrass in a lot of things. In Mexico, you put chili peppers, um, you know, sauerkraut or kimchi, yogurt, again, with those natural probiotics, um, quote unquote, garlic, noni, different things like that can be really important. And those can be part of your daily life. And eating those, I would call them more gentle things. Those are going to help um, you from picking up infections as you go and also avoiding sugar because that's going to weaken your immune system and make you more likely to pick things up. Um, covered a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. Um, do you guys have any questions? You mentioned probiotics, and um, my husband and I have been drinking a lot of kombucha in the evenings with dinner. It's like, hey, it's our sunset. A lot of kombucha. Can that be a problem? Um, I mean, you know, it's... It it depends. You know, if you don't have any fungal problems, I wouldn't be concerned. Um, you know, some people who are big carbohydrate eaters and they're doing kombucha, you know, the Saccharomyces is also used in things like winemaking and other things. So potentially, in someone who has a high carb diet, um, inoculating with it could make for what they call an autobrewery syndrome, where you are producing a little bit of alcohol in your intestines as a result. That wouldn't happen probably on a low-carb diet, but it could happen on a high-carb diet. Also, so again, it could be good, depends on the person. Also, just making sure you're not getting too much sugar in, you know, since you have to put sugar in to make it. So if that's your main source of sugar and you're not getting in a lot of other sweets, then that's probably okay, but if you're doing a lot of other sweets, then you're just basically adding and adding and you're doing way too much sugar in your diet. It would depend also a little bit on liver health since you know that you have um, what black tea and, and green tea is kind of a base so you know if you're if you can tolerate caffeine or not some people can some people can't. So the gram in the bottle usually 12 ounces what do you recommend is the... In terms of sugar or Let's just say the less the better. I mean, if you have a fungal issue, none. But if you don't, the less the better. 
And I'm going to chime in on that because I think it depends on the brands because a lot of mainstream kombuchas will add fruit juices and sugars after the fermentation because they want to make it taste good so it sells. Yeah. So naturally fermented without any added sugar is different, which Paella, when they come, it, uh -huh. is that. So if you don't have a fungal issue, you can buy kombucha. From <laughs> <laughs> so this is for you guys and for all the speakers kind of everything involved with the healing and the organs and all that kind of stuff. If you are somebody on big pharma medicine, how interruptive is that um, in this healing process, whether it's light or kinesthesiology or... Um, it, it totally depends on your body and which meds. You know, definitely in our practice, if you're on immune suppressants, it's tougher to get people well. You know, usually we can do fine with blood pressure meds, and um, it's a little bit tricky if someone comes in for, say, some type of mood disorder and they're on some type of antidepressant, because, you know, we might be trying to modulate epinephrine or GABA or serotonin, and it might have too much of an additive effect with what they're taking, so we might just back off on that and just, you know, let you do what you're doing. Um, so, again, it's going to depend on the med, your body, et cetera. There's no blanket answer to it. I'm gonna say a lot of people though that are on medication, you can still help and get them a lot better. Some all the way better, some all the way better and they can get off their medication. And some you treat them two or three times and you're like, I'm sorry but I can't help you while you're on your meds. That doesn't happen often but it can. But like we have a couple of um, RA patients and we've had some RA patients that have gotten well enough that they can go off of um, like methotrexate, prednisone. We, I have one patient I've been working for three years now, and she's asymptomatic, but she'll, and she's been able to decrease her medication, which we have her do under her doctor's supervision. And so she's down to, she's still like on six milligrams of prednisone, she's still on methotrexate, but before she was symptomatic on higher dosages, and now she's down to that dose and asymptomatic because of the other things we've done. So again, it's all gonna depend. They like really have been appreciating all the information that's been given here, and I, um, my personal take is that it's going to be a blend of this, like Eastern and Western. Like, I love the fact that you're working with a patient, and you're working with their doctor, to come together and decrease the medication or whatever else lifestyle that he or she would be in. And um, I just lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> Um, you were speaking about just being very individualized and when you're caring for a anyone. Mm -hmm. And that is also the language that is being spoken in healthcare too. It's like very patient-centered, right? And I think over this time period, it's gonna move towards that collaborative um, partnership type of, of care for individuals. If, and I know that that might be like very far-fetched ideal thinking there, but I, I believe like you have some healthcare individuals here that also say there's a place for this and there's a place for that and there's a place for togetherness in caring for people. And I love how people are becoming more self-advocate for their own health too and seeking out the I information. Mean, I, I agree. The hardest things, there's a couple of things that are hard. One is ego in healthcare practitioners. <laughs> and two is... You know, if, if, you know, like if you asked us, you know, when is it appropriate to see someone like us and when is it appropriate to go to a, a medical doctor and you ask a, a naturally oriented medical doctor the same, there might be some things that, you know, just, you know, that we would say well, we would prefer us in this and they might say no, you know, we would, prefer, you know, there's going to be some overlap conflict a little bit, per, perhaps, unless you've learned to respect each other and, and collaborate, which is still kind of rare. Another question? Hi, again, I want to uh, thank all of the practitioners here. It's really nice. I've been, I'm the mother of a once diagnosed a severely autistic child. And this right here was one of the first things, and we actually didn't use any of the, we actually used Diflucan. And I know that we can do a lot of natural things, but it was the first time 
um, I saw a, a complete change in his behavior. And, and it's just, it's so refreshing to see this being shared, you know, and there's so many, you know, children that can be helped too. I mean, we actually had to do chelation and all kinds of other things, so it's a very long story. But this was one of the very first things. Now, the die-off was not fun, um, and I actually did treatment myself at the same time, and I just to know what he was going through, and then I realized that I was ill too. So um, I want to say I appreciate all of the practitioners here because you're doing great work. Just keep, like um, Solange was saying, you know, a lot of times you go to, um, you know, an MD or whatever, and they're like, oh, no, that's not for you. That, that'll hurt your kid. And it's like, well, you're not giving me any real things to do for them and so that's when I stepped out of the box and started doing functional medicine and seeing other practitioners because they said yes so again thank you anyone else um I've dealt with candida like pretty much my whole life I was allergic to penicillin when I was little and blew up and all the things and went on a candida diet when knew what, no one knew what it was except maybe Dr. Hyman or something, <laughs> like literally 15 years ago. But I guess my question for you too is, um, wait, I did want to say one thing. Thank you for saying that some people shouldn't be on probiotics. That's so huge because I take them and they're horrible for me. And I think it's so important that you listen to your own body and know what you can do, too, because everyone's like, take the probiotics. Hey, go off coffee. Drink green tea. I can't drink green tea. I can't even process it. But I did have a question for you. If you're, are you always allergic to mold? Like, is there certain individuals that, like, are just allergic to mold, period? Is it always healed? Or... I guess that's my question. Because I'm always like, like say you go, like, I don't want to eat Gouda. I don't want to brewer's yeast. Speak. Like, is there a time where you are just completely healed of mold? Um, in terms of the first part of the question, definitely different people have different degrees of sensitivity. They've shown that genetically in terms of some people, you know, are much more symptomatic. In terms of your second question, do you get over it? Yes and no. So in other words, um, a lot of people, they no longer have it living in their body. They don't have symptoms. But you know, bodies have a memory. Like Chris was talking about, um, this is a little bit off on a tangent, but I, I like to tell this one. They, they, they had rats. I forget if it was rats or mice. But they, what they did was they exposed the, we'll call it a mouse, to almond blossoms, and they had them smell almond blossoms. And every time the mouse smelled almond blossoms, they gave the mouse a shock. So eventually, all they needed to do was have them smell almond blossom, and they would have a fear reaction you know, without you know, getting a shock or not. But the important thing about the study was that the mouse's children and grandchildren, if you brought almond blossoms near them, they were terrified, even though they'd never been shocked. So what happens? Like, let's say you, you have a real history of fungal issues, and your body you know, didn't do well on you know, certain things during it. It might remember that. And so later on, if you expose yourself to it, you know, even though there's no reaction, from a biochemical level, there's some emotional connection trigger. And that happens in a lot of things. Like, for instance, if we have a patient that's sensitive to casein, which is the protein in milk, a lot of them ask us, can we eat ghee? And the answer is, we don't know. There's no casein in ghee. But if the body takes some in, you know, some people's bodies go, uh-oh, dairy's coming in. Dairy has casein. And they start reacting, even though there's no casein in it. Or take fish. You know, fish can be mercury contaminated. And for people who are sensitive to mercury, they can't take fish oil even though there's no mercury in it because as soon as they take it, their body goes, uh-oh, fish. Fish has mercury, and they start that reaction even though there's no biochemical reason to start that reaction. So again, it's going to depend on the individual. 
All right, we don't want to take into Carrie's time, so we're going to hear what she's saying next, but we'll be around with any questions, and um, please feel free to bug us as much as you want later. Thank you. Thank you.